Um, well, thanks so much, uh, Robert, for having invited me. And yeah, really pleased to be here. Um, let me get my slides up. Um, okay. Is it still working? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and you can see the whole screen now? Yeah. Okay, good. perfect. Cool. So, um, yeah, so the um, Feel free to ask questions if you want to interrupt me. Um, I have a like keynote, which sort of eats up the whole screen. And so I don't think I'll be able to see like questions in the chat or anything, but if you have a question, feel free to come off mute and interrupt me. Um, I'm fine to do that. So, um, and uh, yeah, so I'm definitely a fan of like um, all of your group's work. And so it is an honor for me to be here today um, and uh, to tell you a little bit about some of my recent work too. So, Okay, so to start off with, um, humans are the ultimate problem solvers. Um, we use imagination and creativity to find solutions to problems and even create new knowledge. For example, we use objects in unconventional ways. Um, you know, this sort of the idea of like life hacks, like using a dustpan to fill a bucket that doesn't fill, fit in the sink. Um, we build machines that solve tasks for us, um, both um, for fun, like participating in, you know, competitions to build Lego robots um, and necessity, like inventing simple machines, like early, you know, water wheels and, and these sorts of things that, that were important drivers in human technological progress. And we also perform thought experiments that allow us to understand the world in new ways. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is um, Newton's canon, where the idea is like you have a cannon you put on top of a mountain and you shoot the cannon and the cannonball goes forward and then it drops to the earth but you can imagine shooting the cannonball further forward with further and further forces and it'll keep dropping to the earth until eventually it'll start to fall not towards the earth but around the earth um, and so this sort of ability to you know imagine these sorts of situations that might not necessarily be possible but they let us sort of uncover new knowledge and understand the world in new ways so an ability that underlies all of these different scenarios for you know, creative problem solving is what's known as mental simulation in cognitive science. Um, and it's summed up nicely in this famous quote from Kenneth Craig, which is that, if the organism carries a small scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and future, and in every way react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. And so this ability for mental simulation has long fascinated me. And one of the goals of my research is to try to understand how such an ability can help give rise to the types of creative problem solving that I showed on the previous slide. So in this talk, I wanna talk a little bit more in detail about what this mental simulation looks like in humans, and then how well current approaches in model-based deep reinforcement learning hold up when compared to the flexibility with which humans use models of the world. Um, just to foreshadow what is perhaps not a very surprising conclusion, I don't think that we're particularly close yet, but I will talk about some ways um, that I think we can use to try to close this gap, um, particularly along the lines of compositionality. So to start off with, let's talk a little bit about mental simulation in humans. Um, so over many decades of research, psychologists and neuroscientists have found evidence for mental simulation in a very vast range of cognitive domains, ranging from relatively low level processes like motor control and spatial reasoning to very high level abilities like thought experiments and creativity. And really the literature is so vast, it would be difficult to cover all of it, even in an entire graduate seminar. Um, but I think it is possible to distill a few takeaways that I think are particularly useful for AI researchers. Um, and in particular, if you look across all of these phenomena, a few themes appear. Mental simulation is predictive, compositional, causal, incomplete, and adaptive. Um, and so I'm gonna just go through a couple of examples um, to demonstrate what exactly I mean by this, um, just to give you a flavor of you know, how mental simulation works in humans. So first of all, mental simulation is predictive. This means that mental simulations allow us to make predictions about what will happen in the future. Um, for example, in some of the earliest work that I did back in Josh's lab, um, we looked at how people reason about physical scenes like this tower of blocks, asking them questions like, will the tower fall over or what direction will it fall in and so on and so forth. And what we found is that people use mental simulation to make these predictions, running forward a process of intuitive physical dynamics to predict how the blocks will move. Hi. Uh Jess, I, yeah. I don't know if this is just me, but I'm still stuck on the mental simulation and mental model slide. I don't know uh, if that's other people as well. Yeah, that, I see that as well. Okay. Sorry. Okay, let me try stopping the screen share. And did, did you see it go back to the... 
um, like keynote or is it still stuck on the same thing? It's still stuck on the same thing. Okay, let's stop again and try. We're not quite at the level where we can mentally simulate for <laughs> what my slides look like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think I need to maybe click optimize for video clip. I think that was something I had to do in the past. Okay, can you see it now? Yep. Uh, okay. Yeah. And this was the slide it was stuck on, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you see the whole thing? Uh, we can't. We can just see the bullet points on the left hand side, but not. Uh, but can you see? Else. Can you see oh. me changing it? No, okay. Now we yeah. can see it okay. changing. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so this is um, where it was stuck. Um, right, so this was the slide I was talking about when I was saying mental simulation is predictive. So just as a brief summary, um, you know, we had people look at these physical scenes like this tower of blocks, and then they make predictions about you know what's going to happen. And um, based on our experiments, we identified that they're using mental simulation. Okay. Um, Second, mental simulation is compositional. Um, and this means that it's not simply a black box predictor, but a process which is in some sense aware that things break down into parts or compose into larger holes. Um, and one of my favorite experiments um, demonstrating this is this experiment from Slink, Fink and Slayton where they showed participants uh, simple sh sets of simple shapes like this O, triangle, and the letter C. And they asked them to mentally simulate arranging these shapes to form an object that might be recognizable to others. Um, and participants can come up with incredibly creative solutions. Um, for example, imagining moving these shapes around and then forming something like this, an ice cream cone. Um, and, but I actually think you don't really need cognitive science to tell you this. The compositionality of human imagination is readily apparent in the art that we create, from Archimbodel's man made of vegetables to tangrams we play with as children to pasta art. Um, and I think creating these sorts of things wouldn't really be possible if we couldn't imagine or mentally simulate how pieces of the world fit together in different ways to form different things. Okay, third, mental simulation is incomplete. Um, this means that even when it's supposed to operate over all the details, it doesn't and it gets some wrong and strongly relies on prior experience to help inform its predictions. Um, and Frederick Bartlett, who was an early memory researcher, describes this phenomenon well, saying that, you know, memory is not the re-excitation of fixed, lifeless, and fragmentary traces. It's an imaginative reconstruction. Um, and it's, he goes on to say that it's hardly ever really exact. And you can sort of see this play out in the experiments that he ran in which he shows that memory isn't just, you know, remembering something, you know, from rote memory, but it's really a, this combination of what you expect to see, what your world knowledge, and combining that in an imaginative way with the thing that you're trying to recall. And so the experiment goes like this. He showed people a drawing like this owl and asked them to reproduce it from memory. So maybe the participant will, you know, draw something that looks like this. And then the second participant has to memorize the drawing from the first participant and then rep reproduce that from memory. So maybe the second participant draws an owl that looks like this. And then the third participant memorizes the second participant's drawing and so on and so forth. And what you can see is that over time, the errors start to accumulate and point towards people's prior expectations, which is to see something more common, like a house cat. Um, so it's really sort of, you know, again, showing this idea that we're sort of, you know, our memory is this imaginative reconstruction that draws on what we expect to see. And this same phenomenon is looked at on a larger scale by this study by signs.com who asked people to reproduce famous logos from memory. And what they showed is that people get it right in very broad strokes, like they remember the color and the general layout, but they maybe get the details wrong. They forget whether the letters in Ikea are blue or yellow or vice versa. And they forget that the woman in the Starbucks logo is wearing a crown. Okay, fourth, mental simulation is causal, which is related to the notion that it's compositional. We understand what would happen if certain aspects of a scene weren't present or how things might change if we imagined something else to be there that isn't. Um, for example, Gerstenberg et al. showed people these scenes of bouncing balls and asked participants questions like, did A cause B to miss the goal? And they, act, they tracked their eye movements, which you can see as the blue dot in the animation. So that's where the participant is looking at the screen. And you can clearly see in this pattern of eye movements that people are simulating the case where A is not present. So they're looking at B and then looking at where B will go if A weren't there in order to make this causal judgment of did A cause B to miss the goal. And finally, mental simulation is adaptive. So we choose adaptive. Wait, wait, just a quick yeah. question, um, and apologies if you're about to get onto this, but you said in passing that this notion of 
causality is related to the notion of compositionality. Are you going to elaborate on that later in the talk or can you describe a bit about what that relation is? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on it um, too much, uh, but the I guess the idea is that if you want to sort of understand how things fit together, you kind of have to understand the, you know, the causal mechanisms by which the world works. And so they're sort of, they go a little bit hand in hand, like causality is sort of understanding about, you know, how things work when you put them together and compositionality is sort of about being able to reason about putting things together in the first place. That's sort of how I think about it, at least. Does that so make you're sense? You're suggesting that a causal understanding in the a causal understanding of the world yields a compositional understanding, but I mean, it's conceived, we, we see compositionality in a variety of, you know, purely, you know, correlation based uh, yeah. modeling, right? Um, so I don't know if they, the, causal, the meta causal error goes the other way, but I, I understand what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good point. Um, okay, let me press play again. Okay. So, okay. Um, so finally, mental simulation is adaptive. Um, so we choose adaptively how many simulations to run before making a decision. Um, for example, in some of the work that I did during my PhD, I looked at how many simulations people run when making predictions about whether a ball will go through a hole, as in this video on the left. And what we found is that people run very few simulations, say between two and four, but before making a decision, and that they choose this number adaptively depending on how difficult the task is. So when, when the decision is harder, when there's sort of more uncertainty, they'll run more simulations. So um, hopefully these examples just give you, you know, a very brief intuition as to what I mean when I say that mental simulation is predictive, compositional, incomplete, causal, and adaptive. Um, and I'll come back to some of these ideas later in the talk. So just put them aside for now, but keep them in mind. Um, okay, so that's a brief overview of how humans use models of the world to reason and make decisions. And given that mental simulation is such an important part of human cognition, we might think that AI systems should have a similar capacity. Um, so in the next part of this talk, I'll discuss some recent work that we've been doing to better understand methods from machine learning, which similarly build and use models of the world. And this is joint work with um, many great people, but particularly um, Theo Weber and Abe Friesen. And we just recently presented this at iClear last week. Um, so in particular, I'll focus on the domain of model-based reinforcement learning, which has recently seen an explosion in popularity with the hundred or so references I'm showing here from the last few years representing only a small slice of the literature. Um, and all of this work has culminated in impressive advances for model-based methods, which can now do things like beat human grandmasters at Go, solve Rubik's cubes with a robotic hand, design chemicals, and manipulate objects in cluttered physical scenes with complex dynamics. Moreover, model-based methods have, by and large, caught up with model-free methods, achieving similar levels of performance as model-free approaches across standard RL benchmarks, but often with better data efficiency. And these methods are often motivated explicitly by model-based reasoning and human cognition, or at the very least by human level capacities for generalization and transfer. Um, for example, the ability to perform precise and sophisticated look ahead, being able to manipulate previously unseen objects or a better generalization across states. But if we come back to these examples that I showed at the beginning, it feels like these promises fall somewhat short of what would be needed to build agents that can imaginatively and creatively solve problems like these. And in particular, if we look at the list of themes of mental simulation that I discussed earlier, we can identify a number of places where current model-based systems don't seem to align perfectly with human mental simulation. Um, of course, I think we have the first one down pretty well. Transition and reward models are inherently predictive. Model-based RL is predictive, um, but it's not usually that compositional. Um, models are usually pretty black box and they don't always encode structure like say the relations between objects or even the number of objects. Um, and they also don't really capture this notion of incompleteness. For example, many approaches require reconstructing the full observation, which means it needs to be able to predict every pixel precisely. And while transition models do have some notion of causality in that they can predict the outcomes of different actions, they usually lack the capacity to represent entirely different realities um, or interventions, such as what if this particular object weren't here. And finally, planning algorithms aren't very adaptive. They usually use large fixed size budgets to compute a policy or action. 
So all of the observations mentioned on the previous slide are useful, but they're also very qualitative. And so what we wanted to do in this project was to take things a step further and try to understand the strengths and weaknesses of current approaches more quantitatively. And to do this, we asked three questions in particular. First of all, um, how does planning benefit the performance of model-based RL agents? Um, within planning, what specific choices of the algorithm drive performance? And um, to what extent does planning improve zero-shot generalization? And we focused our analysis on MuZero, uh, which is a recent model-based system that achieves state-of-the-art performance on various domains from Go to Atari. Um, and just um, for those of you who might not be familiar with how MuZero works, here's a very quick overview. So we have our standard RL loop, you know, the agent gets an observation from the world, um, and then it uses its model of the world to plan what the best action is to take from the current scenario. Um, and the particular form of planning that MuZero uses is Monte Carlo Tree Search or MCTS. And at a high level, MCTS works by the agent imagining a tree of future possible states it could be in, and then which actions might be good for, to take from each of those states. Um, and importantly, it also uses a learned policy to help guide the search for the best action, um, as well as a value function to do bootstrapping to estimate how good each imagined state is to be in. I mean, you can think of the policy as sort of like, um, in the context of the planner as an educated guess, the agent sort of imagines the best action that the policy recommends and then estimates how good the action actually is with the value function and then it tries the second best and, and so on and so forth. So after planning, the agent chooses the best action that it came up with. And then it also uses the results of the action to improve the policy and the value function. Um, and you can think of this as like a bootstrapping procedure. The search improves on the policy and value function, and then it used, uses the improved policy and value function to update the neural network so that on the next go, the neural network is a little bit better and you can improve upon it a little bit further. So to be able to draw generalizable conclusions about the role of planning in model-based RL, we tested MuZero across a wide range of tasks that varied in their branching factor, time horizon, sparsity of rewards, and variability of initial conditions. Um, so, you know, Control Suite, Atari, Sokoban, and 9x9 Go, et cetera. So to um, answer the first question, how does planning benefit model-based RL? Um, we first looked at different ways of utilizing the search within MuZero. Um, so there's a few different ways that the search can be used. For example, as I mentioned, to select actions, to um, uh, compute these targets for training the policy and the value function, um, and also to select the actions you can do either during training or at test time. And so we looked at all of these different variations. Um, so the one-step model, for example, is very close to model three. Um, it does use a search, but it's limited to depth one, and then it only uses that as a learning signal and then always acts from the prior policy. Um, the learn variant uses a, a full search to compute the learning targets, but only acts from the policy prior, while the data variant uses the full search, um, but just to select actions and not um, for learning, it only uses this like one step version of the search for learning. Um, and then learn plus data combines the full search, both for learning and for acting during training. And then finally, learn plus data plus eval is equivalent to the original mu zero algorithm and additionally uses the search to act at test time. So starting off, the one-step agent only achieves about, say, 50% of the full performance of mu0, perhaps suggesting that using planning in some capacity provides some benefits, though um, I think there's some, a little bit of um, work that my colleagues have done since this, which maybe call that result into question a tiny bit. Um, but I think that's actually the less interesting result in any case. Um, but what we do find is that using deeper search for learning um, gives an improvement to about 68% of full performance. Um, and then similarly using a deeper search just for acting gives basically the same improvement to about 67% of full performance. But when you combine both of those together, um, you get an even bigger improvement, suggesting that they're complementary. Um, and doing this explains the majority of MuZero's performance around 90%. Um, meanwhile, search at test time does very little in most domains. The only exceptions that we found to this were Acrobat and 9x9 Go. Um, and so from these results, we conclude that the primary benefit of search, at least in the common domains, that we tested is to construct targets for learning and to produce a useful data distribution from which to learn. Okay, so yeah, again, primarily um, benefits by constructing targets for learning and constructing this useful data distribution. So within the planning process itself, um, what choices, what algorithmic choices drive this uh, type of performance? 
So to answer this question, we um, will look at another version of mu0 that introduces two additional hyperparameters besides the search budget. Um, so this is tree depth and UCT depth. So with tree depth, um, we uh, this parameter um, specifies basically how deep in the tree we will expand it. So beyond the tree depth, um, we never expand. We always force bootstrapping with the value function. And so this controls basically how far out we are planning a sequence of actions. And what we find is that in most environments, a little bit of look ahead is useful, but in most we can get a, away with having a relatively shallow tree of maybe two or so. Um, this gives you most of the performance. Um, and this includes even games of strategic thinking such as Sokoban, where you might expect that maybe doing deeper planning would be helpful. Um, and the only exception really that we found was nine by nine go where here we do see a deeper, a clear benefit in deeper planning. Um, so we can perform the same experiment, but now with this UCT parameter, which roughly speaking controls the breadth of the tree. Um, so uh, MCTS chooses which actions to explore um, deeper in the tree using this UCT UCT term, which stands for upper confidence bound for trees. Um, and basically um, it forces the search to be a little bit more exploratory. And so what we do is we say that above the UCT depth, we will use UCT to explore, but below that, we're just going to sample from the prior. So we're just gonna do basically Monte Carlo rollouts. Um, and what we find is that again, complex planning doesn't seem to be required um, in any of our common environments used to evaluate model-based RL with a depth of one being sufficient for most environments, again, with the exception of Go. Um, but I think that this is an interesting and important result algorithmically because to implement this version of the agent um, with UCT, DUCT equals one, um, all we need to do is keep track of the visit counts at the root of the tree and then just do Monte Carlo rollouts, which is much easier to implement and parallelize. We don't actually need to do the full tree search. Um, and finally, we also investigated um, the effect of the search budget, and we find that while a very low number of simulations doesn't let the agent get off the ground, a moderate number, say around 10 or so, gives most of the performance. Um, and too much search can, in fact, start to hurt the agent's performance, um, which I'll discuss a little bit further in a few slides. Um, again, Go serves as an exception here um, and only seems to work at high numbers of simulations. So to answer the second question, our conclusion is that the number of simulations seems to be the most important algorithmic choice that we make. The depth and breadth or complexity of the search seem to matter a little bit less. Um, our last question concerns generalization, which as I discussed earlier, is a common justification for why we want to use model-based RL. Um, so first we looked at how much the agent can improve its performance by using more search at decision time, or in other words, running more simulations. Um, so here on, on the x-axis, um, I'm gonna show the number of simulations that we're using only at test time. And then the y-axis is sort of this normalized score. Um, so one is like getting the same improvement as the agent using the, the amount of search it was trained with, um, less than one is worse and more than one is better. Um, and surprisingly, we see almost no improvement for, by using even large amounts of search in most of these domains. Um, though a common assumption might be that, well, you know, the model that Mu0 has learned is imperfect and therefore deeper planner, planning leads to more accumulated errors. Um, so to test this, we redid the experiment, but then with a perfect model. And we find that the results largely hold. Even with a perfect model, we see only very small benefits of more planning at test time, um, with the exception of here, Ms. Pac-Man, but we're cheating a little bit because we're giving it the simulator and that has, it gives the agent actually access to some um, information which would otherwise be partially observed. And so, you know, it wouldn't actually have that information even with, uh, you know, the best model it could learn. Um, but in all the other environments, we don't see this improvement. Um, and this is surprising because we have a perfect model. How could it not help? Um, we hypothesize that it's actually the other learned components besides the model, such as the policy or the value function that could be affecting the performance. And so to test this, we combined the learned value functions with the perfect environment simulator in a different type of planner utilizing breadth first search or BFS. And unlike MCTS, breadth first search doesn't use a policy prior to guide the search. It just tries all actions, but it still evaluates them with the value function. And what we found is that any amount of planning seems to be hurting performance, confirming our hypothesis that it's the value function that's failing to generalize in states not seen during training or in states that are very off policy during training. Um, in other words, it seems that errors in the model of the world aren't the only types of errors that we need to be concerned about. If we want planning to be effective, we also need value functions with generalized too. 
Um, and so in the last few slides, we were only looking at the effect of using more planning at test time for the same environment seen during training, but we also um, looked at generalization to new environments. And to do this, we trained Me0 on a finite collection of randomly generated mini Pac-Man levels. Um, so this is sort of like a toy version of Ms. Pac-Man. The green dot is Pac-Man, um, the red dots are the ghosts, and the blue dots are the, the cyan dots are the pills, and the dark blue dots are the food. Um, uh, and this is, as a toy version, we can sort of procedurally generate the maps here. So we train Mu0 on a finite collection of these randomly generated maps, and then we test the resulting architecture on the handcrafted test level that you can see on the slide. Um, and so I'm going to show you plots that look basically the same as before. The, the x-axis is showing you the number of simulations we use at test time, and the y-axis shows the um, normalized scores with one corresponding to effectively perfect generalization. That's what you would get if you trained directly on the test set. And what we find is that with a learned model, increasing planning only weakly improves performance and eventually catastrophically degrades it. Um, and even with a perfect model, where we do see planning helping a little bit more, especially when we have a low amount of data diversity, so fewer training scenes. Um, but again, too much planning can hurt, as in the case of um, if we have 100 training scenes, we see that it doesn't really improve performance much at all and starts to degrade it eventually. And, and it never really gets up to this level of perfect generalization, even after thousands of simulations. Um, and so our conclusion from this is that planning, even with a perfect model, doesn't necessarily guarantee good generalization performance. So to which extent um, planning helps with zero shot generalization to our surprise and somewhat disappointment, um, not as much as you might think, even with a perfect model. Um, and so our takeaways from this are that simple shallow forms of planning may be sufficient in many popular model-based RL environments. And consequently, these environments, even ones that are sort of classically thought to be planning you know, friendly, like Sokoban, they may not be the right domains for developing more effective model-based RL systems. Um, though I think some of the work that um, this lab in particular is looking at, like with, you know, NetHack and, and these sorts of systems, I think is exactly going in the right direction. Um, and then finally, effective planning requires having good representations for multiple components, um, not just the forward transition model, but we also need to have representations for the policy and the value function, which generalize too. If those don't generalize, then the search isn't going to really improve very much. Um, so I think that this last result in particular is telling because if you come back to the list of properties of mental simulation that I highlighted, many of them, um, com compositionality, incompleteness, causality, these are really about representing knowledge of the world in an, in an efficient, flexible, and useful and reusable way. So I think there's lots of work to be done on all of these dimensions, and my work broadly explores all of them, but for the rest of today's talk, I want to focus on just the first regarding compositionality, um, and I want to make sure we leave time for discussion, so I'm going to go quickly through this last part. Um, but uh, this is work that um, was led by my colleagues, Victor Bast and Alvaro Sanchez Gonzalez, and we presented at ICML a couple years ago. Um, and in this project, we were interested in developing agents that could solve challenging compositional tasks like stacking blocks to achieve a goal. Um, and to this end, we designed a series of tasks in which the agent sees a scene that looks like this with a set of blue blocks below the floor and some number of red obstacles above the floor. And the agent's job is to pick up the blocks and place them in the scene, avoiding the obstacles as it does so. The agent can also choose to make the blocks sticky, which will cause them to stick to any other blocks that they come in contact with. So how should an agent interact with these sorts of block stacking environments? A common choice of action space might be to have the agent take absolute actions like place block D at position 7.2 comma 8.5. Um, but in talking about acting in these sorts of environments, we would probably say something more along the lines of place block D on the top left of block B. Like I, if I was talking to you about this sort of environment, I would never give you an absolute coordinate. I would say it in these relative terms. Um, and so to implement this type of action, we can have the agent directly choose which object it wants to move, which one it should place relatively to, and what the offset should be. Intuitively, this is a little bit like placing a Lego brick. You want to choose the Lego to stack, the Lego to put it on top of, and then the dimple where the top Lego should be placed. However, it's not obvious how to actually implement this type of action format in a standard RL agent, since most agent architectures assume a fixed size action space. But here we're defining actions based on the number of objects in the scene, um, and the number of actions will change as the number of ob objects changes. 
So to deal with this problem, we designed a new type of agent that we called uh, GNDQN for graph network DQN, which operates over graphs. Um, specifically, we take in our scene observation, which is a collection of objects um, um, with attributes corresponding to say like their position, their size, their color, their type, so on and so forth. Um, and we're gonna convert this uh, set of objects into a graph representation. Um, so now we have a graph representation with one node in the graph for each object in the scene. And then we have edges between all of the different objects in the scene. Um, and the nodes have attributes, again, corresponding to these object attributes like position and size and so on. So now we need a neural network to process the graph. Um, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with graph neural networks, but just in case, um, just as a quick overview, graph neural networks have the following important properties that we want to leverage here, which is that of course, they take graphs as input and return graphs as um, output, um, so we can use our graph structured observation here. Um, they're invariant to the permutation or the order of the nodes or edges that we give it, so it doesn't really matter what order of objects we feed it in, it always will give us the same answer. And it, importantly, it scales to different numbers of nodes and edges, and so if each object in the scene is a node in the graph, and our objects are defined based on the number of nodes in the graph, then we can you know, easily have the same graph neural network process scenes with different numbers of objects in them. So OK, we feed our graph structured representation into the graph network. And what we're going to get out are Q values on the edges of the graph. Um, and specifically, these are defined as being these relative actions where um, an, a logit or a Q value on a particular edge of the graph will indicate which block to pick up and which block to place. So basically, we look across all the Q values. We find the one that's largest. And then um, the, you know, the tail of that node corresponds to the block to pick up. And the head of the node corresponds to the block on which we're placing. And then the specific you know, index of that Q value on the edge corresponds to the offset location where we're placing the block. Um, so again, that's something like place block D on block B on its top left. Again, you can think of this like placing a Lego. Um, so to test this, we developed several separate objectives for our agents to solve. We have the silhouette task, where the goal is to place blocks to match these green silhouettes. Um, solution might look like this. Uh, we have the connecting task, where the goal is to stack blocks to connect the floor to these targets in the sky. Again, you can see an example solution below. Um, and this is more challenging because the final structure is more underspecified. Um, it requires the agent to design a solution. Um, and then in the most difficult task in covering, we have to cover the obstacles from above. Um, so we compare the graph network agent to other more conventional types of agents like um, RNNs, CNNs, so on and so forth. And across the board, we find them to do a lot worse in all of the construction tasks, um, which you can see here in the bar plot. Um, but I think looking at actually the videos is the most compelling thing. And so here on the left, you can see one of our baseline agents. This is using a recurrent neural network to process the objects compared to the graph network agent on the right, um, which again uses these graph structured representations and these relative actions. Um, and you can see that while the graph network agent is able to do a pretty good job solving these tasks, the RNN agent really struggles to figure out, you know, where exactly to place the objects, um, you know, when to use sticky blocks, and so on and so forth. Um, similarly, in the connecting task, we find that the best unstructured agent performs a lot worse than the best structured agent and sort of has this degenerate policy of just stacking the blocks up on the side, whereas the graph network agent is able to, you know, weave them in and out in between the obstacles. Um, and similarly, in the covering task, we see a similar strategy for the best unstructured agent. This one, this time, is actually a CNN rather than an RNN, um, but the graph network agent is, is able to, again, come up with this more sophisticated strategy of building these sort of umbrella or T structures. Um, so we can already see that these types of compositional and structured representations help a lot in the context of model-free RL, because everything I was just talking about so far is really just doing regular Q learning just on this graph structured um, architecture and representation. But we find that they also benefit model-based RL um, because we can you know, incorporate planning here by adding a process of MCTS similar to how MuZero uses its search. Um, and we looked at the ability of this planning agent, along with the other agents, to generalize beyond their training distribution, which again is, you know, as, as I said in the beginning of the talk, the thing that we're really looking for. Um, and so, for example, in the silhouette task, 
while we only trained the agent on scenes with up to eight silhouette targets, um, we can test it on scenes of twice as many, so up to 16. Um, and you can see here on the, the graph on the left shows the sort of overall performance. Um, and you see that the lines actually go up here because there's the potential to achieve more reward um, because there's now 16 blocks and each block gives you one point, um, which both of the GNDQN agents successfully do in contrast to the RNN agent. And, and we get you know, even stronger generalization performance with using NCTS here. Um, and so here's just like an example of what this looks like of the agent being, this was trained only on eight blocks, but is generalizing now to 16 blocks. And it's almost able to solve these scenes perfectly. It makes a few errors here and there, but it's, it's really quite good. Um, okay. These results improve even further if we use more sophisticate, sophisticated planning techniques too. Um, and I don't have time to describe the details here, but um, in the paper that we published last year at iClear, we also developed a method called SAVE, which improved upon the original construction agent. Um, and you can see here the green curves are showing SAVE's performance as a function of the test budget compared to the results I was just showing you previously is the green curve, and the blue curve is just a model-free agent um, that doesn't use planning at all. Um, so really having, um, you know, combining these structured representations with planning seems to really bring out the best of both worlds. So as a takeaway for this part of the talk, we can achieve compositionality by using representations that are structured in a way that reflects the structure of the environment itself. And while I used graph networks here for a model free policy, I, I really want to sort of hammer this point that they're just a useful representational tool in general, and we can use them for you know, models and policies. And there's been a lot of successful work using graph neural networks for forward models, particularly in the domain of physics prediction, um, which um, some of my colleagues, Alvaro, who again was the lead on this paper, um, as well as um, Toby Pfaff and, and others have been looking at this to say for like predicting the dynamics of meshes and particle systems and so on and so forth. Okay, so just to recap, um, in this talk, I discussed how mental simulation works in humans, what it looks like in our deep learning agents, and what some of the limitations are. And we can identify that current approaches in model-based RL are qualitatively not yet as compositional, incomplete, causal, or adaptive as human mental simulations, at least in a qualitative sense, um, and, and definitely on the you know, generalization, compositionality side, um, not as much in a quantitative sense, too. Um, but I showed that... Um, and in particular, uh, that this failure of generalization isn't just due to the failure of models, but also policies and value functions which guide the planning process. And we can address this through more structured models and policies like, like graph neural networks, which allow our agents to better learn about and exploit the structure of the world. Um, in particular, it can enable, the, enable them to better learn how objects interact with one another and how to acquire knowledge that generalizes better to things that it hasn't seen before, such as stacking twice as many blocks in the silhouette task. Um, however, this is only a step in the right direction, and I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done until we can really match the compositionality of human mental simulation, um, you know, maybe looking at things like um, self-supervised contrastive methods on the incompleteness scale, object, um, you know, we had some work looking at um, looking at scene editing in an object-centric way on the causality side, and maybe thinking about things like meta reasoning on the adaptivity side. But overall, there's still a long way to go before we have all of the answers. But hopefully what I've discussed today at least gives a starting point for thinking about how to fulfill the promise of model-based RL in building general, creative, and imaginative problem-solving agents. So I just want to thank all of my collaborators and colleagues, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, and just as a parting note, if you're interested in the construction tasks, they are available on GitHub. Um, and also, um, if any, you know, if you're interested in learning more about model-based deep RL, if it's a topic you're interested in, um, I gave a tutorial on this with Igor Mordach at ICML last summer, um, and all of the videos and stuff are available online. So uh, thank you very much.